Okay. So anyway, everyone, uh, you're being recorded. And here we go. So you should see the Microsoft Teams. Uh, I mean, the PowerPoint presentation, sorry. Um, hopefully you all see it. And Seems we'll go to be working. Good, good to hear. So uh, welcome to, oh, wrong lecture. <laughs> I'm looking at that lecture saying March 4th. That's not the right one. Oh, it's the right one. I just didn't change the date. Okay, so I probably have to reshare that. Oh, I'm going to turn off the system audio because there is no audio for this. I'm going to unshare that and reshare that. Sorry about that. Okay, so you should see the PowerPoint slide uh, with the right date now. And uh, we'll go ahead and go through. Okay, so um, did did Mike did Michael did you um, do your Red Star OS presentation already? Um, I have not. Okay, do you think you're up to trying to share it on Teams? Uh, yeah. sure. I completely forgot about it, but <laughs> I've, I'm sure I can. I'm sure I can do it. Right, you have your presentation and everything, so you should be able to share the screen. And you were in. I think you were in all my test uh, class team viewer sessions, so hopefully you you will be able to do it. Um, and then we have coming up uh, Josh, Jacob, and Ochir on Kali Linux, and then Haiku OS uh, from Jessica. And let me know if there's issue, like you don't have a microphone or something. We'll have to figure out something else to do. And then. Um, Last week we had a um, review of the quizzes, chapters one to four, and a midterm on on Friday. Uh, so for so f a few of you took the uh, midterm early on Thursday, and unfortunately the administrator left it in my office, and now we can't find them. So for those of you who took the midterm early on Thursday, um, Please retake it online. Um, I the password is spring 2020, but again, I might just take the password off uh, since it really doesn't matter. Um, it's not protected so much anymore. We're going to have to be completely on the honor system as we go online here. Um, so. That is the end of the administrative stuff. So we have to retake the test? Uh, those that took it on Thursday. Yeah. Early. Uh, that was me. <laughs> that was you. Yeah. Yeah, it was you. That's sad. <laughs> and um, so uh, hopefully you remember your answers and should be straightforward, I'm hoping. Sorry for the inconvenience. Um, the, our administrator looked all over the place looking for it, but we couldn't find it. So, unfortunately, um, all right. So, also, I got a message about um, not forgetting to check the bell on YouTube. I'm not quite sure, Michael. Could you uh, clue me in on, on what you mean yeah, there? That was just a joke. Uh, YouTubers say that. I was I was just making a joke. <laughs> oh, okay. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Um, it just means that you'll get uh, notified when you upload a video. That's all it is. Okay. All right. So,
So, oh, and the chapter four assignment, I thought I had a PowerPoint slide that said this, but the chapter uh, four programming assignment has been pushed back. Um, so it should be easier to complete in time. But also chapter four is threads and you get to choose any of the programming assignments at the end of chapter four that you like. So it, I think it should be a pretty straightforward assignment. Uh, and uh, I believe um, a lot of you do a lot of Java programming. In my mind, that's like one of the easier. And maybe it's just because I have the most experience with um, Java. But to do it in any, you could do it in any language you want, any operating system you want, all those in chapter four. So you get to pick one and um, proceed from there. Uh, so let's see. We were in slide 23, or actually, I'm going to review something because I know I covered it. But since it's been such a long time since uh, we got together, we talked about the uh, consumer producer problem, which is basically uh, produce one uh, thread or process, uh, puts things into a data queue, the producer and the consumer reads it from that same queue and consumes it when they when they become available. So it consumers waiting for items to be put in and the producer is looking waiting for space to be available in the buffer. Uh, so uh, now go, moving on, we had the readers writers problem, uh, which is a very common uh, issue. And I mentioned how um, the airlines have actually punted on this for as, as far as I know, uh, because um, it's hard to do efficiently and without deadlock and starvation issues. So they have decided just to have a parcel solution and then uh, deal with um, double bookings or seats. Excuse me, I don't think um, the uh, presentation is on the screen share. Oh, thank you. I did not share it again, I guess. Okay, you should see it now. Looks good. Okay, great, thank you. So did it just drop off or did it, was it never showing? Uh, oh, it wasn't, yeah. it never showed. Okay, uh, so anyway, um, the reader writer problem again is is the common problem and and it's one that the airlines have to deal with and that's the readers can read um without conflicting with each other but then they have to be synchronized with the writers and um we want to allow multiple readers to read at the same time but only a single writer can access the shared data at the same time and also that means that when the writer is in and actively writing the readers can't um, read as well because it's inconsistent at that time. We talked about there's a couple of variations of the reader and writer. Um, so one is the readers kept waiting unless the writer has permission to share. Or another option is once the writer is ready, it, it's allowed to enter the system immediately, kicking out um, all the readers. Um, and uh, there are other variations. Uh, um, some of them involving starvation that we discussed last time. So we looked at a solution. We have a data set, a sim for read, write, mutex, uh, initialized to one, which is ex exclu mutual exclusion for the writers that they can get exclusive access and sim for mutex initialized to one, and that's uh, for the read count. So the semaphore counts the number of readers that are in the system. And the recount is initialized to zero because initially there's no readers. So we here see here that the, the writer basically waits on the read write mutex. And um, then write as soon as it gets access um, through the semaphore, writing is performed. And then it's when it's done writing, it signals that it's done with the read write mutex. For the reader, uh, we wait on the general mutex right here, um, then we say the recount is incremented 
And then if the read count equals one, meaning we're the first reader into the system, we wait on the read write mutex because we cannot uh, read at the same time that um, a writer is writing. Um, so then once, once we get in there, we signal the mutex that we have gone through the general mutex operations of checking. And then we do our read perform, reading perform. Um, then we wait on the mutex to up, update our count and dec decrease our reading count uh, once we're done reading. So here we can see that we're trying to allow as, as much parallelism as possible. And then we see if recount equals zero, we signal the retype, read write mutex, which basically says the recount, read count is zero. There is no readers. Any writer waiting to write is now allowed in and we will allow them to proceed. And then we signal our general mutex, which is the protection of all the data structures as a whole. So that's the solution for the reader writer problem. So I went through that pretty quickly. Uh, are there any questions? I wanna make sure that everyone understands um, both of these. So let's look at the writer process. Writer process is, is much more straightforward. It is waiting exclusively on the read write mutex and signaling the read write mutex. So that's pretty straightforward. Any questions about the writer process or how that works or um, any questions like how, how could that work? Okay, so that was pretty straightforward. And then here's the reader one. So again, we were waiting on the general mutex to access the read count. We increment it. And then if the recount is one, we're the first reader in, we then write on, wait on the writer to make sure that there's no writer currently accessing the data. Then we signal the mutex saying that we're no longer accessing this, these uh, recount structures. So the recount can be used. We do our reading and then we, after we're done, we wait on the mutex again because we're gonna update the count. And this should be read underscore count, not read space count. So that is an error there in the code that I have on the screen. So that this should, uh, right after the wait mutex, there should be read underscore count minus minus. Then again, recount equals zero, says the writer can write, and then we signal mutex. We're no longer using read count. Everybody, anyone who wants can now access the read count. Okay. All right, so uh, I'll leave it up for a little bit just in case anyone uh, has come up with a question. Okay, so we're moving on to the next um, classic synchronization problem, which we use to evaluate synchronization mechanisms. Uh, this one is um, actually a little amusing. It's the dining philosopher's problem. So we have um, a bowl of rice in, in, the, in the middle that the philosophers are trying to eat, and they have a chopstick in between each of the different uh, diners, dining philosophers. And the the scheme is, is that they need to share the chopsticks between the two adjoining philosophers, and you need two chopsticks in order to eat. You can't just eat with one chopstick. So um, there is no, um, and basically the, the scheme is that the philosophers spend their times either alternating between thinking and eating, and they have to wait for and synchronize with their neighbors about getting the chopsticks. Um, you need both chopsticks to eat, which I said, and then we release both when we're done. So when we're thinking, we have we don't we don't have any of the chopsticks. Uh, in the case of the five philosophers, we have the shared bowl of rice, and then we have a semaphore, uh, five semaphores that correspond to the five chopsticks. So that's the general problem.
And uh, you actually get a chance to do this problem uh, in the chapter five programming assignment when you get to that. So here's the uh, solution. Um, so the um, philosopher waits on chopstick sub um, uh, chopstick I, which is the chopstick associated with the philosopher. So so each of the philosophers are numbered. Uh, and so, for instance, uh, dining philosopher one would need chopstick one, and he would also need chopstick two from his neighbor next to him. So this is exactly um, what's stated in the next line. It says what, wait on chopstick I plus one mod five. That is looking for the chopstick of the neighbor next to them going up. So if we're going clockwise, that would be to the left. So uh, then we eat once we've gotten both chopsticks and then we signal chopstick sub I that it is now available. And then we also signal chopstick I plus one mod five to say that um, the other, the neighbor's chopstick is now available also. So um, deadlock is definitely a problem in, in this particular solution. So um, it is possible for uh, the philosophers competing and nobody can actually get both chopsticks because they're all holding one chopstick and and refusing to release the other one until I get the other one and I get a chance to eat. So there's various solutions uh, to this problem. One is allowing only four philosophers sitting simultaneously at the table, which in my opinion is cheating, but you can cheat. Um, we allow a philosopher to pick up the forks only if both are available. So basically you check um, on both chopsticks and you only grab uh, the chopsticks if both are available. Uh, that means that the picking up of the chopsticks must be done in a critical section because um, if you're waiting for both chopsticks to be available and before you grab it and then you start grabbing it, someone else might be doing it at the same time. So that means that must be done in a critical section. And then uh, another possibility is using an asymmetric solution where the odd number philosopher picks up first the left chopstick and then the right an even number of philosophers picks up the first, the right chopstick, and then the left chopstick as the second choice. So again, you're um, making, you're putting the neighbors and the and the philosophers doing it in, in different orders, uh, depending on which of those philosophers you are, the even or the odd philosopher. So um, we talked about semaphores, and basically semaphores are associated with a waiting queue. And, um, we're talking about, in this case, we're talking about counting semaphores and that dining philosophers solutions. But there's various problems with semaphores. One is that their um, incorrect use of semaphores can result in deadlock and starvation, and it's very easy to end up with a situation where you have a deadlock or starvation situation. Um, we expect a wait on the mutex followed by a signal and one uh, semaphore that's misbehaving can break things easily. And because of that, programming errors can um, are very common in these wait and signals semaphores. So you have to be very careful in your development of the code. And I like to have the synchronization portions of code not distributed across multiple classes if possible and really made concise to be in one area of code because once you start spreading this use of semaphores across different areas of your code, it get, gets more and more error prone. So that's uh, sort of a word of advice um, when dealing with semaphores. So semaphores does have the advantage that they can be very, very efficient, but they are um, problematic in lots of ways. So other mechanisms have been created uh, to deal with these issues. So one solution is monitors. Um, it's a high level abstraction that provides a very convenient mechanism for process synchronization. In fact, it is such a 
a nice abstraction that a lot of your um, more modern and high level programming languages have monitors built into them. And we'll uh, look at that uh, a little later in, in coming slides. So basically a monitor is an abstract data type where internal variables are only accessible by code within that procedure. So within that model, model mo uh, monitor, only uh, that monitor can access that, that code within that monitor. And what we do is we have this monitor, and here we have monitor name as being our monitor. Generally, uh, in object-oriented programming, that will be a class that will be your monitor. And only one process is allowed to be active within the monitor at a time. So that becomes your critical section. Anytime you access a procedure in this monitor, um, and in Java, it's actually a method that's labeled as a critical section method. Um, no other processes can be using this particular code at the same time. So for instance, we have a process that comes in and it calls process P1, and another process comes in and it says, I want to access proce procedure uh, P4 or, or even P1. That process is not allowed to uh, enter in or use the monitor code until the first process has completed its uh, usage of the code within the monitor. So we have condition variables uh, within the monitor, and uh, you can have multiple conditions. And so we have X and Y here, and two operations are allowed on a conditional variable. One is we wait. We're waiting on someone to signal us uh, on X. So we have a condition X. And when we're in the monitor, so we're actually a process executing within the monitor, no other process is allowed into the monitor at the same time. We then get in the state where, okay, now we're waiting on, on something from another thread or another process. Well, what we do is we do an X wait, which says, okay, I'm done, but I still have things left to do from within the monitor. I'm waiting on an X dot signal from some other process. So you put yourself in a wait state. Again, um, we talk about leaving things in a consistent state. You have to have all your variables in a consistent state, or you have to be ready in a ready condition that you're ready to run in the next is what Bailey phrased it in a previous lecture. So basically, everything has to be in order before you put it, things in a wait. You can't have it in a consistent state. And then you wait for a signal when you once you put yourself in a wait. The X signal is exactly um, the flip side of that. It's where uh, a process um, invokes a signal that then frees up the uh, first process or the process that invoked the X wait to continue. So this is sort of a pictorial diagram of what it looks like. So in the upper right corner above the that egg there, the oval shape, we have the entry queue. So that's the queued up processes or threads um, that are waiting entry into the monitor. So they're trying to access the monitor. So we have this queue, um, a FIFO queue in this case, but you could, could prior prioritize it so that you give priority to other processes. Then we have in the, the shared data that we're, we're, we're protecting. And then we have um, queues associated with uh, the conditions. So here we have the X and Y conditions. You could have multiple conditions that you would wait your, put yourself in a wait condition. And th those are the processes that are waiting for signals. We then have various operations in that white part of the oval, which is um, basically the procedures or methods within the monitor structure. And then basically the blue is just initialization code that's setting up the monitor. Normal initialization that you would have um, like with any class, but you would also have that ability to start up before anybody enters or does anything that there's some code that allows you to initialize 
things, and that would be the the queues and the for the conditions, the entry queue, and all that kind of of stuff. But any initialization need, needs to be done before the monitor can be used. Are the uh, could you go back? Yeah. Um, are the conditions in the X and the Y um, are those like so? Those are done by processes. They are actually set up ahead of time in the monitor. So that would be um, part of your monitor design okay. and design usage. But the processes would, um, once they got things in a consistent state and are waiting for some condition, they are the ones that would put themselves onto the condition queues X or Y. Does that make sense? Does that clear mm -hmm. or i guess i guess so like does so the conditions can like happen before x and y checks them i guess that's what i'm kind of thinking um so the conditions are actually named x and y are and are predefined it would be part of your initialization code the monitor would have them predefined already and that would be sort of the contract that the threads coming in would know is that these are the available conditions that I have available to me that if I want to put myself in a wait and wait for a particular condition to be true or, you know, be fulfilled, um, that I would stick myself on that queue. And then the signalers that are saying that these uh, conditions have been fulfilled would also already know about it. So you're not actually creating these queues on the fly. They are inherent in the monitor. Okay. It's not, it's not the thread that's creating it. The threads are only using these queues. They're not creating them. They already exist. The threads come in here and they just know that those are available to them, but they are not creating. That was That's the initial design of the monitor itself. Mm, okay, thank you. Yeah. Any other questions? Okay, great. Moving forward, uh, we can see the conditional variables uh, signal and um, what happens when someone has done an X a conditional wait on, on X and the signal comes in? Uh, basically, it says that both Q and P, the two processes, I guess P is doing the signal and Q is doing the wait, cannot execute in parallel. If Q is resumed, then P must wait. So the signaler will automatically get... Um, put into a wait state if he's the signaler. So the options that can that you can design your monitor to be is signal and wait. P waits until Q either leaves the monitor or it waits for another condition. Uh, we can have signal and continue, which Q waits until, um, until P either leaves the monitor or it waits for another condition. So these are the two options that can be designed for the monitor. You would um, choose one or the other, uh, and it wouldn't change. It would basically, you choose that either um, the signaling process P waits for the process that's coming out of the queue um, to leave the monitor, which is a very common solution, or um, Q waits for the monitor to uh, leave I, for the process thread or process to leave the monitor, or the process decides to wait for another condition. So the the process that um, put itself on Q would then put itself in the Q for for um, condition Y or I believe you could even put yourself back on the condition X like you're waiting for another one. So both of these different solutions um, have different pros and cons, and so it's up to the language implementer to decide. And um, we can see here, um, and that sort of implies that, is that monitors are implemented in concurrent uh, Pascal, uh, and in Mesa, C Sharp, and Java. So there, like I said, there's many high-level languages that um, have 
the monitor built into it. So if you look into uh, Java classes, for instance, uh, you have things called synchronized methods. And when you make a, a synchronized method, that is exactly what you're doing. You are um, make, turning this class into a monitor and you're saying that all of the methods that have the synchronized word on them cannot be used at the same time that some other thread is using one of these methods. So as soon as some thread goes in and calls one of these synchronized methods in Java, that means no other thread can go in and use another synchronized, the same or another synchronized method in Java. So it is a very, oh, so I got a, a message that the slides are no longer showing. Is that still correct? Uh, Jason. I think it gl glitched for a moment. He posted, never mind. Stuff seems to be a little bit delayed. Oh, okay. I see. Yes, okay, great. Um, so anyway, yes, it's... Uh, it's it's such a powerful mechanism It's designed into the language and actually there is an operating system that has central in it uh, the monitor in the operating system i believe it's the xenix operating system which is kind of like unix spelled um, backwards i wish i had my text with me uh, on it but there is actually an operating system that has central to it uh, a, mon a monitor in it so uh, it is a very powerful mechanism and it has the advantage in that it sync it, it co-locates all of the synchronization code to one place again i when i gave my advice on using semaphores i said try to centralize your use of semaphores to a common area or even class of code here monitor does that for you in that it's um that it's in a class for for the instance of Java or, or C sharp, it's it's in a single class. And so all your synchronization code is in one place, which makes management and understanding of the synchronization uh, strategy and plan and techniques that are being used easier to understand because it's all contained in one place. So here we see uh, using a monitor solution for the dining philosophers, and uh, it actually becomes very nice uh, to do. So we look at um, the various states uh, that can that you can have, which is thinking, hungry, or eating. So thinking is I'm not doing anything. Hungry is I'm trying to get chopsticks, and then eating is I am currently have two chopsticks and um, am trying to eat. So um, then we have a, a variable state with five of them for the five philosophers. And then a condition variable self um, for uh, the current state that I'm in. So um, we first have, so here's our monitor and we have two methods. One is pickup and one is put down, and uh, I is the the count associated with which philosopher I am. So each of the uh, philosophers are numbered zero through four, um, assuming it's a zero based uh, like Java and C sharp. And so we have here um, that when we're trying to pick up with a uh, variable I, we put our state, we put the state of us, um, to hungry, and then we test the state um, of ourselves. And uh, that variable is in the next slide. I mean, that method is in the next slide uh, right here. And uh, here we, we say if state i plus 4 mod 5 does not equal eating and the state of I that I set myself is hungry uh, and state I plus one mod five is not eating, then I am allowed, I'm gonna set my state to eating and then signal 
my my self state that says that uh, you are now allowed to eat. Uh, we're going to come back to that. It's it's a little bit much to take in right now, but let's go back to the initial state. So basically, we um, we set ourselves our self state to our current state to hungry. Then we do a testing of the state to check to see if I'm not eating. I then want to try to uh, eat. So I'm going to. Um, oh, sorry, I skipped. Uh, so states of I equals hungry. Then we do the testing to see if um, I'm in a state where I can get both chopsticks and uh, change myself to eating. And uh, once we exit from that state. If the state sub I is not eating, we put ourselves in a wait state, waiting for someone to signal that I am allowed to eat, that there's a that my chopsticks are available. Uh, and that's what I do if I'm not eating. If I'm eating, then everything went fine, and I actually have both chopsticks, and I will be eating. And that happens in the test method that we looked at briefly. Uh, that we look at the put down method. And there we set our state to thinking, and then we test the, the left and right neighbors, and the left and right neighbors will then be signaled that they have chopsticks available to them, and we'll look at that now again. So here, going back to here with that additional knowledge that we had, we say, uh, again, state is the, is the global state that everyone's looking at, and self is the condition that we are waiting on and waiting for signals on when we can't get both chopsticks. So here we say the state of I plus four mod five is not eating. That is the chopstick, say, to the right if you're going counterclockwise. Uh, and um, I'm hungry. And the state of I plus one mod five, which is the one on the left, is not eating, then that means I can now set my state to eating because the both chopsticks are free because both my neighbors are not eating. So let that sink in a little bit. Okay, so then uh, we have uh, these, when we're eating, we sev signal self that we are now allowed to eat. We were in the hungry state, and now we signal to self, which was set here, where we're doing a wait. If we're not eating, then we are waiting to be signaled that we can we're eating. And, and this and this is the the signal that says both the left and right neighbors are available to eat. So why is that important to have the signal here? If we go back here, we can see if someone has put down um, a chopstick, they then do a test on their neighbors. The test I plus one mod five and the test I plus one mod five. I I plus four mod 5, I think I said the same thing twice, I plus 4 mod 5 and the I plus 1 mod 5, both of the neighbors are told to test. We're testing on both neighbors, and in this test, this is where that signal will be happening. If you weren't eating and you were waiting, this is where you would get signal that says, both my, uh, that, that my neighbor told me that I dropped a, a chopstick down, go ahead and and um, signal yourself if, if these conditions are true. Again, if both other neighbors are not eating. So in the case of I drop down my chopstick next to my neighbor, if his other neighbor is also not eating, he will be signaled. Otherwise, uh, this test will uh, still result in, in a waiting state. So here, um, I noticed that the bracking is a little confusing. So here we have this big giant if with all these different conditions about I'm hungry and the neighbors are waiting. You see that in the if with the curly brace. And then we see 
I mean, with the the rounded br- bracket, and then with the curly braces, we have the state sub i is eating and the signal self. Unfortunately, the indentation is a little off there. Uh, you would expect the self sub i dot signal to be indented a little bit further in. Uh, Right. <clears throat> and then uh, we have the initialization code that sets all the philosophers equals their state equal to thinking initially. So um, I would uh, recommend you take a look at this solution in um, the text. This is in the text as well. And uh, make sure you understand stand this. Um, and and then it's clear and certainly feel free to give me a call or chat um if um if this doesn't make sense to you but you will get a chance to do this uh, for your chapter five programming assignment so hopefully uh you'll get uh, a get a chance to um actually Try this and see how it works and get a deeper understanding of this code. So one thing is, is um, generally a monitor will be built using a se using semaphores. And so if you were to write your own monitor rather than using the language one, which you probably would not ever do, uh, this is how you would do it. We have semaphore variables mutex uh, initially set to one so that one uh, thread is allowed into the monitor because it's available right away uh, initially and then <clears throat> the next is initially set to zero uh, that is your signalers and then uh, next count equals zero so each procedure will be replaced with a weight on your mutex which is getting access to the monitor and then we're in the body of F, which is the function that we're calling. And if next count, which is uh, is greater than zero, which is um, people that are waiting, we signal next. And the else we signal uh, uh, the mutex, <coughs> which is allowing the... Um, threads queued up to enter the monitor. So this one, the entry queue, that's signaling the entry queue. So you always give preference to the, um, the signal um, threads because they're the ones that are currently in the monitor, although waiting, so you give priority to them. So mutual exclusion into the monitor is ensured, and we have these rules about entry into the monitor. And then here's how you would implement the condition variables. So for a condition variable X, we'd have semaphore X semaphore, X underscore sem, initially equals zero, and X count equals zero. So we currently have no body waiting on the wait queue. When we do a wait, I'm sorry, I was scrolling like I was scrolling through code, uh, we increment the count, x count plus plus, so it says we now have another, um, we have a thread, that new thread that's uh, on the waiting queue. Then we, um, if next count is greater than zero, we signal next. So that means that um, we have a, a signal available. Otherwise, we signal on the mutex, which is the mutex, if you remember, is the, the variable for entry into the monitor. So we either um, are signaling the next um, person waiting on this condition to that they can proceed, or we are signaling that the next one in the monitor um, can proceed.
So again, this is we're putting ourselves on a wait. And so now we, we either signal that someone waiting on a condition um, can continue or um, that someone can now someone else can enter in the mem the monitor. And that's the case where there's nobody waiting on this condition. Any questions? OK, like I said, you generally won't ever be implementing this. They would be using an existing monitor that exists in the language, your language of choice. Or hopefully uh, at least a lot, some type of library situation, but mostly it would be a language. <clears throat> so here's the operation for a signal. X underscore count is greater than zero. That means that we have things that are waiting on this particular condition. We increment the next count, and then we the signal the X semaphore. So basically, whoever's next in the queue or um, next in line uh, on that particular condition is signaled to continue. And then we wait on next. We wait uh, to be released. And then uh, when we are released, uh, our next count is decremented by by one, saying that there's now one fewer um, thread that is asking to be released um, after signaling. Any questions? Okay. Not critical. It just sort of gives you a feeling for it. Again, this is not something you would ever, I can imagine, would never um, be doing implementing yourself. Um, so resuming a process within a monitor. So if, if several processes are queued on a condition X and X is signaled, which should be resumed? So one easy way is a FIFO queue. If you're the first one in, you're the first word out, and we just get queued up. Um, but there also is, um, which I kind of referenced in my discussion earlier, the possibility that you actually are giving a priority. And that is, oops, sorry, wait, uh, x dot wait c, which is a priority number, which is how pri how prior how much priority do I have? Of course, that would be part of your design, um, which threads and which processes have highest priority. Um, and it says process with the lowest number, which actually is highest priority, is scheduled next. Again, the key thing is the highest priority task obviously gets ch chosen above the others rather than a FIFO queue. So that is our five minute warning. So, uh, which is good because we're that takes us to the next topic, finishes up monitors. Any questions about the class or this lecture in particular? Did you want me to do my presentation? Next week, do you think you're up for it? Oh, next week? All right. I mean, not, not next week. I mean, next lecture. Next like, yeah, next lecture. Yeah. Yeah. All right. Yeah, let's, sounds good. Let's, let's try it. Mm -hmm. Okay. We, it, we, we may punt and do something else, but uh, let's, let's, let's give it a shot. Yeah. All right. So next, next lecture, though. Yeah. All right. Sounds good. I'll hide it off to you, Michael, and then let you go. Okay. Yeah. Any other questions? And yes, please uh, send me um, an email or give me a call or a text message. Uh, the the phone number I left is my cell phone number, so you can send me a text if you have any suggestions. Um, thank you all for muting your mic when you're actually not in the process of, of talking because that definitely does improve the sound quality. And I will be posting uh, this class uh, both on the YouTube channel and on Canvas. So uh, with that, um, you're all free to go and have a great um, rest of the day. And uh, hopefully we all have a good semester ahead. I'm sorry about all this uh, commotion and upheaval that we have, but um, we'll get through this and it'll be good. All right. Have a great day, guys. Bye. Bye.